presented by Common Sense Institute, welcome to a special episode of Common Sense Digest. On Tuesday, May 2nd, Common Sense Institute hosted Coffee and Common Sense, a conversation about Arizona's changing economy. We welcomed an expert panel to discuss how Arizona's economy has transformed over the last decade, what's driving this, and what obstacles will policymakers need to overcome to ensure it continues to thrive. We hope you enjoy this special episode of Common Sense Digest. Now, here's your host, Glenn Farley. Hello, thank you for joining us for the recorded version of our second Coffee and Common Sense. I'm Glenn Farley, Director of Policy and Research for the Common Sense Institute here in Arizona. By way of background, the Common Sense Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit research organization. We focus on state and local policymaking, and our mission and vision is that good data and good research can inform the creation of good policy. Good policy, in turn, supports the healthy economic growth of the state. I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking all nine members of CSI's board, without any of whom we would not have been able to have been successful as we were during the first year of our operations here in Arizona. The CSI Arizona team consists of six full-time staff, three of whom are local here in Arizona. In addition to myself, Director of Policy and Research, there's also Katie Ratliff, our Executive Director, and Cameron Brunner, our Research Analyst. I'd also like to thank Winged Victory for their support and assistance. Daniel Scarpinato and Michael Kittleson, not on this slide, are our consultants and strategic advisors. The subject of today's presentation is going to be Arizona's changing economy. You know, typically when we have a conversation about a changing economy, be it Arizona or anywhere really, we're going to be talking over relatively long timelines. That can be decades or generations. The reason for that is, again, typically, economies tend to change relatively slowly. What's interesting about the past five to 10 years or so, though, is that for some states, Arizona in particular, that story isn't very true. In fact, Arizona's economy today, in many ways, looks very different than it did not just 10 years ago, but in other ways, different than it did just five years ago. The subjects I'm going to discuss to kind of add color to that are first, population workforce, changes and issues that have materialized there in the past half decade or so, prices and inflation, and finally I'm going to close out with a discussion of drugs, crime, and homelessness. And that'll be the most forward-looking part of the presentation, I think. All right, let's begin by talking a little bit more about our population and workforce. Okay, so population growth. States can really grow their populations in two ways. One is demographics, that's the natural cycle of births and deaths, and the other is migration. It can be domestic migration movement between states and international migration movement between countries. In the case of Arizona and the United States and the Western world, really, a period of long demographic change means that births are less and less fueling population growth. It's no longer natural population growth. Rather, growth within states in the United States is, and growth in nations within the Western world is increasingly being fueled by migration, the trends of movement of existing populations across borders. Arizona, for its part, grew extremely rapidly in the early 21st century due to rapid in-migration. That was movement. About half of that came from other states, and about half of that was movement, international migration, largely from Mexico. During that 10-year period before the Great Recession, we averaged population growth due to net migration of roughly 100,000 people, and it was most of our total population growth. Then the Great Recession happened, and mobility, both mobility between states and international mobility, fell precipitously. Net migration growth in Arizona fell in half virtually overnight from about 100,000 people a year to somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people a year. And it remained at those newly depressed levels for about a decade thereafter. And that became the kind of new normal. And Arizona policymakers and the state's economy had to try and adapt to a new period of much slower relative growth, both population growth and resultant economic growth. Many folks took this for granted. It was assumed that those trends would continue in perpetuity. And from a demographic perspective, that forecast has been right. If anything, the demographic change has only accelerated in the past couple of years. We're having even fewer kids today than we were prior to the pandemic. But one interesting result of the 2020 COVID pandemic was a massive upward surge, particularly in domestic mobility, the rate of domestic migration movement between states. What we saw is, for the first time since the Great Recession, movements took off. Arizona, for its part, added about 120,000 
net migrants during 2020, the peak of the pandemic, the highest since before the Great Recession, and the vast majority of those were domestic migrants, movements between states largely coming from California. And rather than returning back to prior trends after 2020, it's remained elevated since. We've continued to draw in about 100,000 people a year, similar to the period prior to the Great Recession. The big remaining difference being that it's largely, again, domestic migration. International migration remains relatively depressed compared to the pre-Great Recession era. Okay, so if we're adding about 100,000 migrants a year since 2020, and that's most, if not all, of our population growth, and that means we've added about 300,000 people to Arizona's population over the past three years. About two-thirds of those are working-age adults. That gives us roughly 200,000 new working-age adults in Arizona since 2020. Yet, the labor force that's both employed and wanting to be employed workers has only expanded by about 100,000 people. What that means is we're only converting working age adults into labor force participants at about a 50% rate. This is extremely low. The aggregate or average labor force participation rate is over 65%. And historically, that rate has been closer to 70%. So that means at the margin, we're only converting about half of our newly eligible working age population into actual labor force participants. That gap is creating the workforce shortfalls and the labor shortfalls that you've heard discussed in the media and the news. I had alluded to this on the prior slide, but this slide shows us the labor force participation rate in the United States for the period 1990 to 2022. Today, about 63, 64% of the adult working age population in the United States participates in the labor force. In 1990, that was closer to 67%. So we've been in a period of slow, gradual decline of adult labor force participation. Why is that? What's driving that? Well, to answer that question, let's first imagine that this chart zoomed out a little bit. And instead, we were looking at labor force participation between the period roughly 1950 and 1990. We would have seen something very, very different. We would have seen a gradual increase in the participation rates from maybe something in the 50 to 55 percent range around 1950 to a peak of about a 67% participation rate in early 1990. And that invites two questions. One, what caused the rapid growth in those prior decades? And two, what happened in 1990 to cause that slow decline? Well, we have a ready answer to the first question. It was the entry of women into the workforce around 1950, peaking in around 1990 that caused that rapid increase. And that rapid entry of women into the workforce masked a separate underlying trend that was being missed in the aggregate data, and that was the slow decline in male labor force participation over the same period. Now we've overlaid on this chart the labor force participation rate since 1990 for men specifically, and now we can see that trend that's really been going on much longer than just 1990, um, but was masked again by that entry of women into the labor force. And that's the trend of slow decline in male labor force participation for about 75 or 76 percent of adult men participating in the labor force in 1990 to today, less than 70 percent, closer to 68 percent of adult men are participating in the labor force. Contrast that with what we see with female participation in the labor force over the same period. We're roughly flat. Indeed, without the pandemic and the associated disruption, which removed a lot of women and men too, but, but disproportionately impacted women from the workforce, we actually would have seen increases in female labor force participation over the period 1990 to 2022. But again, including that pandemic disruption, their participation is roughly flat. So it's not that we're removing women or not adding women to the labor force at the same rate as we have historically we are. Rather, what's happened is their participation rate has stopped increasing. That historical rapid increase in female participation masked a longer term secular trend of slow declines in male labor force participation. Now that the female rate of participation has stopped increasing, we're starting to see the male trend drive changes in the overall participation rate. And that's causing us to observe that slow decline in aggregate participation. And so now we're starting to understand why there's a workforce problem, at least in certain parts of the world and the, the country, like Arizona, that are experiencing population growth. 
And the reason is, yes, we're growing our population, but we're not converting that population into labor force purchase business. And more specifically, we're not converting the adult male population into labor force participants. To put some color on that statement, were adult men participating in Arizona's labor force at the same rate today as they were in 1990, there'd be nearly 300,000 more available and willing workers in this state alone. And again, to reiterate, women continue to participate in the workforce at roughly the same rates, if not potentially greater rates than they were in 1990. The manufacturing sector for its part has actually been one of the bright spots in attracting new workers to fuel needed growth, even as the larger economy has struggled with an overall labor shortage. And as I say that out loud, that should hopefully surprise some of you. The story of manufacturing, not just in Arizona, but in the United States as a whole, has been one of slow and gradual decline. Manufacturing jobs in the U.S. peaked somewhere around 1979, and it's declined consistently and persistently ever since. And it's just declined despite the efforts of policymakers, not only at the state level, but also at the federal level. Many administrations, from Reagan to George Bush and Barack Obama, have made manufacturing in the United States a priority. Despite those efforts, though, manufacturing continued its slow decline, and folks sort of took it for granted that this was a natural part of economic progress and wealth and prosperity gains, and that manufacturing was going to shift from the developed world to the developing world. And that appeared true until somewhere between 2011 and 2017, the post-Great Recession period. Arizona, for its part, doubled manufacturing job growth roughly around the 2011-2012 period from roughly 1% a year to roughly 2% a year. The U.S., for its part, doubled its manufacturing job growth a few years later in 2017. That doubling of job growth, at least at the national level, was coincident with the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which made numerous reforms to federal tax law as it related to incentives for investment in manufacturing and job growth industries in the United States. The data strongly suggests that that policy change and that incentive change resulted in the growth of the manufacturing sector in the U.S., but it wasn't evenly distributed. The red line here is manufacturing job growth for California. There's effectively no change in its long-term trends pre and post Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The blue line, on the other hand, is the same curve for Arizona. There's rapid bending of the curve. We were already growing relatively robustly, but that growth accelerated dramatically following passage of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The other interesting thing is look how well the state's manufacturing sector performed during the COVID pandemic. Compare that to the performance of California's manufacturing sector or the U.S. as a whole. And that's the, the 2020 period that's in those gray bars on your screen. Since the pandemic, nearly 20% of all jobs the state has added have been in its manufacturing sector. And for the first time again in decades, manufacturing as a share of the economy is a growing sector rather than a shrinking sector in Arizona. We think that's directly tied not just to federal policy choices, but also state and local policy choices, which the divide between Arizona and California helps illustrate. Okay, so to summarize our workforce and population growth section, the COVID pandemic was a period associated with the return for the first time in a decade to rapid population growth in Arizona. Unfortunately, that rapid population growth was not being converted into rapid labor force growth at the same rate. We think that's part of a longer term trend in declining labor force participation, not so much generally in the United States, but amongst young men in particular. However, a bright spot in that growth is our state's manufacturing sector, which defied all prior expectations to begin a period of extremely rapid growth somewhere in the 2011 to 2017 range, continue that rapid growth during and after the pandemic. Today, it's really one of the bright spots of Arizona's economy. Moving on, though, now we're going to talk about prices and inflation in the state and nationally. After remaining at about a 2% level persistently from roughly 1990 to 2021, persistently and consistently, inflation has since taken off. We've reached levels not seen in the United States since the early 1980s. First question we should be asking is why? With the benefit of hindsight, it's hard to see how inflation could not have taken off. During the pandemic period, the federal government spent 
with borrowed dollars, about $6 trillion in a period of 18 months. This is an unprecedented level of increased federal spending. At the same time, the Federal Reserve printed or monetized about $6 trillion worth of federal debt. So we had the federal government borrowing and spending, and we had the Federal Reserve monetizing that borrowing and spending rather than crowding out private investment. The consequence in hindsight was a rapid increase in inflation with about a 12-month lag on that spending. By June of 2022, real-time annualized inflation at a peak of 17%. Again, an unprecedentedly high rate for the modern period, last seen in the United States sometime in the early 1980s. Big numbers, right? But what do those numbers actually mean for consumers generally, and particularly consumers in Arizona? Well, inflation has hit the Phoenix market harder than any other major city in the United States, according to federal statisticians. Last year, prices increased in the Phoenix area by 11.5% from a year before, versus just a 6.5% for the U.S. as a whole. What that means is, if a household wanted to buy the same things today that they were buying at the end of 2020, they need to spend about $850 more per month to fuel that consumption. Obviously, this isn't realistic. Household incomes haven't risen fast enough to enable them to maintain that level of consumption change. So in practice, consumers are responding by, yes, paying more for some of the same stuff, but also behavior changes. They're buying less expensive substitutes, buying less in general, etc., etc. So this means we're both paying more and we're also sacrificing quality of life to cope with these rapid price gains. But I mentioned something that should be relatively surprising. It certainly took me by surprise when I started looking at the data on that prior slide, and that's that Phoenix had the highest rate of inflation in 2022 of any major city in the United States. In fact, we can see something even more interesting if we look at just the top five and bottom five cities for cumulative inflation since 2020 in the U.S. Those top five cities are again Phoenix, but then Atlanta, Tampa, Miami, and Dallas. That's Arizona, Georgia, Texas, and Florida. Those states all have something in common. Specifically, they have a reputation as being relatively low cost of living states. On the other hand, if we look at the cities who have had the lowest rates of cumulative inflation since 2020, we've got two real standouts, and that's New York City in New York State and San Francisco in California. Those two cities join their five their fellow three in the bottom five as having their own reputations of being extremely expensive places to live. So we've seen kind of an upending or inverting of historic norms. Namely, we've seen that costs, costs of living are rising rapidly in places we traditionally thought of as being cheap places to live and prices not rising anywhere near as rapidly in places we've traditionally thought of as being expensive places to live. It's an interesting question why this is happening. I think it's all connected. We talked about the rapid surge in migration into Arizona. Well, there was a similar rapid surge observed in Texas, Florida, and Georgia as well. The rapid in migration, the rapid demand growth that that brought with it has shifted price increases away from the shrinking cities and the shrinking states and into the growing cities and the growing states as a result. Zooming back out to the macro level, there's an old elementary economics textbook concept called the Phillips curve. And this posits a negative relationship between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. That is, all else equal, during periods of low unemployment, you should have high inflation. And during periods of high unemployment, you should have low inflation. That relationship was based on data collected from the United Kingdom and the United States from roughly here, 1850 to 1950. And it appeared pretty strong and consistent and persistent, creating that elementary concept of the Phillips curve. Well, this is a scatter plot of unemployment and inflation rate data in the United States for the period 2000 to 2020. See a curve? I don't. Effectively, during this period, the Phillips curve was dead and buried. It was thought that there was never a relationship at all, that it was a theoretical misunderstanding, and that we need not worry that low unemployment would cause high inflation or vice versa. This is that same data, but now plotted for the period 2020 to 2022. Suddenly, I see a curve again. Indeed, it appears the relationship is back and back with a vengeance. During the 2020 period, we had high unemployment and extremely low inflation, lower even than the 2% target and inflation rates approaching 0%. Since then, the unemployment rate has fallen, but coincident with those declines, we've seen the inflation rates rise. Now we're in a period of 
low unemployment, but extremely high and persistent inflation. This suggests that perhaps it was premature to say the Phillips curve was dead and buried, and either something has changed in the economy to restore the Phillips curve, or it was always there and just hidden by something else. It remains an interesting open academic question, what's going on? I present it just as an interesting anecdote. Something else interesting about the pandemic period, at least in Arizona, is that inflation and rapid price increases weren't limited just to our consumer prices. Housing prices, an asset, took off as well. Between 2020 and 2021, we saw a rate of unprecedented home price appreciation in the Phoenix area, roughly 40-50% annual price gains. It really dwarfed anything we'd seen previously, even during the Great Recession era, the last period of, of rapid home price appreciation. Then something else happened after 2021 into 2022. As the Federal Reserve pivoted to try and bring down the nation's inflation rate, they began to raise target interest rates. That trickled into the mortgage market. For the first time in really a generation, we began to see rapid increases in the costs of mortgages in the United States. I want you to consider that for the average home buyer, roughly 95% in fact of all homes bought and sold in the United States, costs of the mortgage are at least as important as the cost of the house. Over the 30 year period that you're going to repay that mortgage note, about half of your total payments are going to be on the interest and the remaining half on the principal. To try and account for this, we concocted last year something we call the misery index, which is just a normalized sum of both housing prices and mortgage interest rates to try and capture the full and complete picture of what it actually costs to buy a home. We saw an interesting result that I wasn't really anticipating, and that was that those summed costs are relatively stable across time. Even though home prices have increased since the 80s, interest rates have fallen at about the same rate also since the 80s. And it meant that all in for the average home buyer, you were in roughly the same position in 2015 as you might've been in 1990, at least in terms of, of dollars of expenditure. There are two great departures from those historical trends. And one of those is the, the Great Recession period, where we saw first a rapid increase in home prices and then a rapid decline. And the second is today. What I want you to notice, though, is that the increase today really dwarfs what we saw during the Great Recession. And that's because of two things. One is, yes, the rapid price increases, but the other is the rapid interest rate increases. Interest rates more than doubled in about a year as the Federal Reserve tightened. They've reached the highest rates that we've seen during the modern period. It's really an unprecedented level of interest costs for modern home buyers. And the home prices, while they've stabilized or even started to fall in parts of the Phoenix and Arizona markets, aren't falling nearly rapid enough to absorb those interest rate costs. The net effect is that it's never been more difficult to buy a home in Arizona. And counterintuitively, that isn't shifting into massive value increases for the homeowners, since a lot of those costs are, again, interest rate costs and not home price costs. This slide gives us another way of looking at the same data that I present in the Home Buyer Misery Index, or maybe even slightly different data that tells a very similar, if not same, story. What we do here is we look at interest rates, home prices, and also wage rates to try and calculate for the average Arizona household buying an average house. How many hours of work would that household need to put in in a month in order to make that mortgage payment? If we go backwards in time to December 2015, it was about 33 hours of work, and that's roughly stable. You're talking a 30 to 35 hour of work requirement across time in the state. Go to 2020, the beginning of the pandemic period, and consistent with the story I just told you, that it increased, yes, but only from about 33 hours to about 35 hours of work a manageable and not dramatic incline. Now look at what's happened between just December 2020 and December 2022. Same average household, buying the same average home, earning the same average wage, now must work 67 hours per month to afford the mortgage on the house, nearly doubled from 35 hours just two years ago. Okay, so to summarize what we just talked about, COVID pandemic year was characterized by a period of massive federal fiscal stimulus. That stimulus was supported by monetization at the Federal Reserve, which in turn has fueled inflation. That inflation shows up in consumer prices, but also asset prices, things like homes, stocks, and other assets. As a consequence of that inflation, the Federal Reserve is now reversing its easy money stance and tightening monetary policy. 
That tightening includes rapidly rising interest rates, which have trickled back into the home market through high mortgage costs. The combination of high mortgage costs and high home prices has made conditions untenable for new home buyers in Arizona and to some extent the United States as a whole. Now though, we're gonna move on and talk about drugs, crime, and our upcoming research that'll be particularly focused on the issue of homelessness in the Phoenix area. So one of the central themes of this presentation you've probably gleaned by now is that for decades, the United States and Arizona were in the midst of long-term secular trends that everyone sort of took as fact, gospel. They were never going to change. There was population growth trends since the Great Recession. There was manufacturing trends since the 1970s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another one of those long-term trends is violent crime rates. After peaking in the late 80s, violent crime began a steady decline in the United States and in Arizona around 1990. And that steady decline continued through recession and expansion, policy change, etc., etc. And many people simply took it for granted. There were lots of attempts to explain why it was declining, but no one argued that it was declining and it would continue to decline. Fast forward to about 2010 to 2015 and something interesting happens. Like many of the trends we've talked about, the slow decline of violent crime first ceases with crime rates effectively flatlining and then violent crime began to increase. Since 2014, violent crime rates in the United States have risen 9.4%. The rise in Arizona has been even more dramatic. We were one of just three states with, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, a significant crime rate increase above the national average in 2021. Those three states are Arizona, Colorado, and Washington State. On average in the Phoenix area, you today have about a 1 in 200 chance of experiencing violent crime, again according to the Department of Justice. Why did violent crime rates stop falling? Why are they now increasing? Why are some cities being hit harder than other cities? These are all good questions that we don't have conclusive answers to, but CSI has done some research in the Arizona area on the opioid crisis specifically, and we see some interesting correlations. Namely, that rising rates of opioid abuse and overdose and deaths correlate with rising violent crime rates in the Phoenix area. There appears to be a link that perhaps we should have recalled again from the lessons of the 70s and 80s between drug abuse, street drug abuse specifically, and overall crime rates in urban areas. Interestingly is how the street opioid abuse problem was precipitating became a problem again around the 2014-2015 period. Specifically, historically, going back prior to that, the problem of opioid abuse in the United States was one of prescription drug abuse. At peak in about 2014, there were nearly 260 million active opioid prescriptions in the United States. That's nearly one active prescription per adult in the U.S. at the time. In response to this crisis of perceived abuse of the opioid prescription market, policymakers at both the state and the federal level drafted numerous new laws and regulations intended to crack down on this. And that crackdown was largely successful in it if its goal was to reduce the rate of opioid prescription. Opioid prescriptions today have fallen in half. There are about 140 million active prescriptions as of 2020. However, rather than reducing abuse and dependence on opioids, it appears that instead, the effect of that policy was to shift demand away from the gray market for prescription drugs and abuse thereof, and towards the black market of abusive street opioids, in particular, fentanyl. Fentanyl, unfortunately, is in many ways much worse for the user than were the prescription drugs they may have used previously. As a result, opioid deaths have risen despite the crackdown. And that's because, again, the fall in abuse of prescriptions has largely been substituted by abuse of fentanyl. The fentanyl problem then links into larger issues. By itself, a crackdown on prescription drugs alone may not have resulted in a fentanyl crisis, but combined with the crisis on the southern border that precipitated around the 2020 period, which diverted federal border resources away from smuggling interdiction and towards migrant processing, has enabled the easy flow of drugs like fentanyl from Mexico into the southern United States. At the same time, cartels in Mexico have a ready supply of the fentanyl precursors from manufacturers in China that they may not have had access to historically. Combine all of these factors together, and we have the perfect storm, if you will, of the 2015-2016 period 
In terms of what this means as a cost for the state of Arizona, we did some research last year that used a methodology developed previously by the CDC to estimate the costs of opioid abuse and dependence in Arizona over time. In 2016, when the crackdown on the prescription drugs originally occurred and opioid abuse was identified as a crisis, the annual state cost was about $15 billion. Fast forward to today, post that crackdown, and unfortunately, the cost is much, much worse, having nearly tripled to over $50 billion. The opioid crisis is now at its peak. That crisis has shifted from a prescription drug crisis to a fentanyl crisis. And it appears that that fentanyl crisis in turn is driving our problems with crime and our problems with homelessness. We haven't conducted a study on homelessness today, but we are beginning to do so. And what we found so far is again, that homelessness is up in Arizona, a handful of other key city markets since 2020. And homelessness is intrinsically linked to a city's crime problems and a city's drug abuse problems. Look forward to that research to follow shortly. That concludes my presentation on Arizona's changing economy. For those of you who were able to join us live, this presentation was followed by a panel discussion. I'd like to take this final opportunity to again thank our panel members, that's Danny Seiden, CSI board member and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Jan Daniels, CSI housing fellow last year, who is quintessential in the production of our housing policy report, and Steve Macias, CEO of Pivot Manufacturing and also CSI board member. Again, panelists, thank you, and thank you for everyone who was able to attend. If you have any questions or comments about this presentation, feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is glenn at csinstituteaz.org. You can also reach out to Katie Ratliff, our executive director at katie at csinstituteaz.org. I also hope you'll continue to follow us. We're on Twitter at csinstituteaz. We're also available at info at csinstituteaz.org.